So one of, let me start by asking the hardest question, perhaps. Um, we are very harsh on um, climate deniers in terms of um, a field in which the scientific community has worked very hard to establish it. You want to come? All right, you should. You, you're, you're not relieved of work here in the jello if you want to come back up too. And that sounds like <laughs> a question I already given. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> where the scientific community has really worked extraordinarily hard to form a consensus. I think really unique in the history of scientists being mean, the IPCC and others. Um, and in other areas, um, uh, particularly around genetically modified foods, for example, um, we also have a lot of data, perhaps not the IPCC level data on safety and environmental effects and things like that. Um, and then we have to make a decision. You as an executive uh, make a decision. Policymakers have to make a decision. Um, would anyone like to comment on how we should be using the science, how we should be balancing relative risks? Um, it sounds like obviously nothing is without risks. Um, and, and perhaps is there a path for making these decisions if it's not only shareholder value, fortunately? Um, how do we make these hard decisions? Anyone like to start and comment? Well, I, I uh, since I was up last, I'll, I'll be first. Um, uh, I, I do think uh, we need to have uh, better discussions around around risk benefit. It's it's well documented that most people um, just don't process risk information well, so. A movie can come out about a theoretical, never before seen sharks off the coast of uh, of, uh, of Martha's Vineyard, and and people will be scared to go in the water for 40 years, even though, as is pointed out over and over again, more people die driving to the ocean than die in the ocean. So, it's we just have a very poor processing of risk benefit, and we tend to. Um, sensationalize certain kinds of risks and minimize other kinds of benefits, particularly the ones that happen over a long period of time. As you know, for example, in the federal budget, because of the federal budget process, nothing with a benefit longer than 10 years is counted as a benefit in the federal government. Therefore, all vaccination, according to the regular, regular way of doing the federal budget, uh, has no payback. In order for vaccination to be supported, there had to be an explicit overrule of the budget process. Well, that's you know that's crazy. The science supports the benefit, but you made a rule that you weren't going to consider it. We do this all the time. So we, I think, classes on risk benefit would be a great addition to everyone's education. I'd start them at age six, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can jump in. I'm I'm continually mystified at human's ability to work against their own best interest. And I think a lot of it is, is this short time horizon. I mean, obviously in the case of the fossil fuels, um, there are long-term societal implications that I, I think a lot of the um, fuel companies are ignoring. In the case of GMOs, as I think one of you brought up in your, um, your talk, um, often the activists are holding two conflicting views that are diametrically opposed. I mean, how do we, how do we find food to feed people um, without looking towards doing things differently than we've been doing it all the way along. Um, that's just a, <laughs> I don't have any answers, but I'm equally as frustrated. <laughs> I would have a hard time trying to classify algae-based protein cultivation as an organic food, just basically because of all that process that's been oriented in, uh, throughout the producing it but it has a better environmental footprint, theoretically. So. I think also, Fred, we, we have a society that is largely scientifically unsophisticated, but very media-oriented. So Twitter, YouTube, and Wikipedia is a source of a lot of information, some of which is true. Um, and in our experience, we've actually had Jurassic Park cited against us as a, as a threat. Uh, for uh, the use of genetic modification. Salmon coming exactly. In. And, and if you look at surveys, 
Sam and Rex. The scientists who accept climate change, uh, the numbers are very high, but again, in the average population, the difference between the general population and the scientists is quite large. The same is true for all other issues of technology. So it, it says two things. First of all, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity in our universities and in our education systems to improve that level of sophistication. In our own case, our biggest problem is most people have no idea where their food comes from. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. true in our Congress. Mm -hmm. It's true in our elected officials. Uh, and it's true in our general population. Uh, people think that eggs come in little cardboard cartons, milk comes in a plastic container, and that meat comes in nice little cellophane packages. They don't associate it with the living organism and they don't associate it with the process. And all of that means we have a lot of work to do. When it comes to the science, what we have to insist from our public officials, I believe, is that they use sound science. And generally, when there are genuine issues of scientific debate, the policy reflects that. When the issues are false, we have to assure that the policy does not reflect public opinion as opposed to the best science available. Hey, Joe, you run an organization that's trying to educate people as much as anything else. Um, do you have an impact? How do you have a bit more of an impact on a population that sees living things as adorable like your penguins but ultimately is, um, is concerned with food supplies. Well, I think you, you, you use the fact that they think animals are adorable to draw them in and get them excited. And then I think the important thing is to engage them in the realities that they need to know and, and, and that they need to um, begin to understand and trust scientists, for example, in actually telling them the correct information. So I think, I think the, the cuteness, the, the fact that people do engage um, in being connected to animals and to uh, natural world is, is, a, is a way to draw them in and to engage them. And I think it's a very important role of, of aquariums and zoos and museums to do that. Let me ask Josh a question. Josh, when one of the legacies, I think, of Vertex is the remarkable role the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation played um, in promoting science that was critical to their constituency. Um, but they were real partners with you. I think that was part of the legacy. Are, are there models there that can be more broadly leveraged in business? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's back to George Merck. Um, when we started the cystic fibrosis program at, at Vertex in 1998, um, our internal uh, business people uh, were absolutely unanimous that there was, n there was no model, there were no circumstances in which we would ever make any money on this program. Um, they showed me the numbers, uh, they showed me the assumptions. Um, it was Im absolutely impossible. Um, and I said, I don't care because that's not my mission. My mission is to transform lives. So I thought we could transform lives there, so we went ahead. You know, funny, it turns out they were wrong. We'll make a lot of money on it. The Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, who invested $80 million in that program, just recently sold its Vertex royalty for $3.2 billion and is now one of the richest uh, disease foundations in the country. So, um, you know, doing good has a, has a way of paying off, especially if you don't worry about it too much. Um, it's the folks who try to a maximized profit who end up not getting profit and not doing much good. So I think there's, it's an old fashioned lesson. It's, there's so many examples of this in business over and over again, where um, as long as you're attending to your own business sustainability and, and you're, you're not fooling yourself about that, um, micromanaging your business to uh, maximize profit is just not the right way to run it. Do we have questions uh, from the audience? Um, we have a microphone, we have a question over here. Uh, this is for the aquaculture. Um, with over 60, I guess, grocery stores, chains not willing to carry your product, do you see it being viable in the market in the future? 
The short answer is yes. Uh, does it disappoint us and, and are we disappointed in those decisions? That was a well-organized campaign by a series of NGOs who have an anti-technology agenda. Greenpeace and a number of other organizations uh, did that with ag products a few years back. So it's sort of a well-established paradigm. Interesting, some of the big suppliers, uh, the big purveyors of seafood, uh, did not jump on that bandwagon. And it's very easy to say that you won't sell a product that's not in the market. Um, the, the dynamic, once the product is available, may change. Uh, but some big suppliers like Costco and Walmart are more concerned with sustainability and more concerned with quality than they are with uh, those sorts of, of extortion attempts. Uh, it's, it's a fact of life uh, dealing in, in the uh, society that we deal with. What I've learned is uh, they have a right to their views. Uh, we respect their opinions. Uh, what we don't accept is that uh, these groups who claim they speak for consumers really do truly speak for all consumers. Uh, and we believe that uh, the best way to evaluate whether our product has any value is to put it into the market and, and find out. We're going to make Corey run here from side to side. <laughs> So it's springtime on a college campus, and some 45 years ago, uh, there was a lot of turmoil on college campuses and strikes that shut them down to oppose the Vietnam War. Um, there are now discussions on many campuses about divesting um, endowments from fossil fuel and energy stocks and comments that it won't put a dent in you know, the profits of the Exxon Mobiles of the world. Um, and there's an increasing call from some to become more active, especially as scientists in particular. There's actually a headline that was in a commentary in Nature a while back saying it's time to get arrested. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on when it, in fact, becomes so apparent that we need to do more than just be good scientists and publish good data and you know, do the best we can to become uh, activists and perhaps become arrested. And, the role of civil disobedience, if it will, um, in this uh, going forward. I can answer that because I crossed that uh, <laughs> threshold a while ago. Um, we, we're, we're trained, we have it beaten into us that our work should be policy relevant, not policy prescriptive. Um, I'm not quite at the point where I'm ready to get arrested yet, but I may get there. But it's, it's so patently obvious that um, unless we act now and we act responsibly. Um, I have two young daughters. I mean, their future is being determined now. So the argument against it is, well, I'll have less credibility. You know, I've got 75 peer reviewed publications. I've got, I mean, whatever you want to, if somebody wants to call that not credible, fine. But I don't want to be the wrong side of this when history looks back. I mean, I want to have done everything I can to make sure my kids have as good a future as I can. So for me, that's the bottom line. It's simple. So I actually have experience going before, uh, before a university uh, board saying that in, in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon accident, basically jokingly at the time, but suggesting that we should divest from uh, deep, uh, deep water drilling. Um, it was not taken too well by some people, but other, others laughed it off. Um, this was actually about two, three years before this, this, this whole divestment process really came to ground. And the way I like to think about it, too, is universities themselves are great sources of insider information. Um, they know, they have all the experts that, uh, that including Brian, um, on what the impacts of climate change are going to be. And the value of these companies such as Exxon or, or Shell or these other oil companies that are out there are sort of based upon this assumption that they can keep doing business as usual for a long time. Well, at some point, uh, there's going to be a straw that breaks the camel's back. There's going to be a tipping point that I think will have the public sort of say, hey, this is not sustainable. We can't deal with this anymore. I thought that would have happened with Katrina. I thought that would have happened with Deepwater Horizon. I thought that would have happened with Sandy. I don't know when it's going to happen, but when it does happen, it would mean that these companies get devalued in a very, very, very quick time frame. Um, and you actually saw that to a small degree with, with Deepwater Horizon. Um, so I think, I think there's, there's actually some opportunity in holding that discussion. How do we value our future and how do we value these, these, uh, these institutions that are supposed to live in perpetuity and have a broad social outreach and engagement and educational mission? 
Um, it's it's certainly a challenge because these, as as like any of the other companies that that uh, got mentioned today, they need the money from their endowments to sort of create us uh, to, to, to support their research. But I think uh, an example, a good example of, what, of how it was thought about was what Stanford did, and they picked up and said, "Hey, no no more coal. Coal is a dying industry, and you can see that in a whole bunch of different charts." And they said, "We're done with this." Now that might have been something to just placate the activists at Stanford's campus. I don't know, but I it, think it, was it a helped very a lot that, that Stanford was two thousand miles away from the nearest coal mine. Too. Yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> mm. My problem with the divestment movement, and just a full full disclosure, I'm I'm chairman of Wesleyan University, who has uh, it, a well-known activist uh, yeah. reputation, um, is that um, is that it's so indirect, um, and it's uh, I have no problem with protest, uh, but as I tell the, the activists on our campus at Wesleyan, um, I know what good protest was. I stopped the war in Vietnam. So, um, you know, what you're doing actually isn't going to make any difference. So I can tell you some things make a difference, but you're not doing them. Um, it's a symbol, and the symbols have their place. But if you put all your energy into symbols, um, the the, the the beat's going to go on. It's not that change doesn't happen from symbols. So um, that just be a just cautionary tale uh, that uh, it's a symbolic act with no consequences. Exxon couldn't care less whether you own their stock. They couldn't care less. It has no economic consequences. Not a penny of their bonus depends upon you owning their stock. I interject one thing here, which is uh, about voting. Um, there's a new initiative being launched uh, based on the observation that many of the same people who you're hoping will protest aren't bothering to vote. And there's a serious initiative, the Environmental Voter Project, just being launched in the next weeks um, to actually use the kind of big data, Brian, you're using to identify these voters um, and point out to them they can make a difference, particularly at the local level particularly in house races, which are often decided by razor thin margins, um, if they would take the protest to their, and become voters as opposed to um, feeling disenfranchised by, by the process. So that's my only pitch here, and I'll yeah. back off that a little bit. But uh, it is a big issue. We see this among our students, uh, many of whom are, are not voting. So, um, good, other questions? So I'll just ask one ther totally theoretical question, and then we should adjourn to a reception and to some drinks, and we can continue this. Um, Plato thought we should all be philosophers as we govern our society. And uh, maybe we can need everyone to be a little bit more of a scientist, and, but also a philosopher when we talk about risk, when we talk about benefit. Uh, perhaps those philosophy courses my colleagues are teaching here uh, are just as important as the business courses and the science courses. Um, and did anyone want to make any last comments on the panel here? The, just, just to say here, here, um, the, the most important thing that someone can do if they start a company or try to make a company successful is to make sure it, it has a mission worth living up to and that it lives up to its mission. Okay. So... Uh, oh. Well, I was just going to add, but I, I think the B side of that is um, if we stay in the realm of philosophy, nothing's going to get done. I mean, I, I moved here two years ago because I wanted to, to be part of a program that got its hands dirty. They went out and worked collaboratively with the community. So I, I completely agree that we, we start with the, the principles, but at some point we've got to try, we've got to make mistakes, we've got to move forward rather than just agonizing on where we go next. And, and I, I think that's what we're all trying to, to do here. So I have a whole bunch of people to thank. Um, first, our speakers, and thank you. Um, I, I think it's a challenge to uh, each of you to be invited to a panel that's quite this diverse, and I appreciate each of you accepting that challenge and uh, hopefully stimulating what is a, a remarkably challenging discussion. Um, second of all, Corey Blanchard, who is, is responsible for making all of this work today, and I Really do want to thank Corey for her efforts. Um, and uh, all of my colleagues at Bentley University who do entertain these discussions 
on a day-to-day -day basis, and, um, and we all hope our students are listening. So with that, uh, the reception is upstairs in the Dandies room. There, there are uh, stairs for those environmentally conscious people that lead up two flights, and an elevator for those who may need, may need that right in the lobby, and we'll help you um, uh, wander up there. More of our colleagues will be there, and also is pub night for the Bentley faculty. So I hope you'll join us. Thank, thank you all for coming. <laughs>